Uh, hi, I'm Hugh Chen. So I'm a PhD. I'm a PhD student, and uh, my topic of uh, study is actually sexual selection. So in the course of my studies, I've actually found out that sexual selection is is actually one of the very important uh, forces that have been um, molding morphological evolution. Now, what do I mean by that? Remember, John was talking about natural selection. So sexual selection is actually a part of natural selection. We have what we call viability selection, which means like survival selection. If you die, you don't get to mate. If you don't get to mate, you don't get to reproduce, and your fitness goes down to zero. The other form is sexual selection, basically how you acquire mates, how you how are you able to pass on your genes down to the next generation, and so on and so forth. So, today my talk is actually about how sex can lead to an extreme diversity of uh, morphology. Some, I mean, I'm going to show you lots of examples, some of them just seem outwardly alien-like, so let's just take a look at humans first. <clears throat> so this is from the Voyager plug, I had to make a few additions to that to show how uh, the, the different sexual dimorphisms in human. First, we have like body size, males are bigger. Proportions, women are more, tend to be more slender. Muscularity, uh, breast development, body hair patterns, and as well as the genitals. Now let's look at other cases of sexual dimorphism in the animal world, okay? So we have lions, where, where in the lion we have a big mane, whereas the lioness does not have a mane. Now we look at the peacock. The male has a big train which he uses to impress the female. This is a pond skater. On the top is actually the female and the bottom is actually the male. You can see how different they are. And of course we have the common spiders. In general, spider females are a lot bigger and more colorful as opposed to males, which you can see somewhere down here. This is the, this is the male and this is the female. A very big difference. Now, in one of the most extreme cases is uh, what we call the strepsiterns. These, these are actually a very specialized group of uh, insects. So here, the male is roughly insect-like, and this is the female. Looks like a log, you know? <laughs> so, why is that sexual dimorphism? Why, why do we see so many different aspects of uh, morphology between males and females? All right. This has a lot to do with different roles and strategies that uh, different sexes actually take. Okay, let's look at this cartoon here. We have entity A and entity B. Okay, these entities need to reproduce to, to produce their progeny. All right. So the blue and the red circles actually uh, represent the amount of investment that the each of the entities will contribute to making the progeny. So, eventually, in, in any game theory, you'll find out someone will try to cheat. Here we have the blue guy trying to reduce his amount of investment and which the other, the, the other uh, entity, the red one, has to pick up the slack with. Eventually, you find out they, 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 it becomes an adoption of different strategies between these two entities. Blue entity tries to go for motility. I'm going to invest less resources, but that means I have to actually seek out the resources of the other entity, which is the red one. Eventually, what you find out is... Why is it not working? Oops. You find out that one sex actually focuses a lot on motility, very little investment into the what we call the gametes. Gametes are basically the resources which you use to produce the progeny. Okay? And the other one, we have the... Uh, entity having a lot, a lot of investment into the gametes. And this is what we have, the basic egg and sperm theory. Egg is really huge, where sperm are just, just tiny, you know, very expendable, not so sacred. All right? So this is what we call, <laughs> this is what we call anisogamy. This is what we call anisogamy. N basically meaning... Uh, uh, not ISO meaning same gamete, which is the gamete. So there is a different uh, reproductive capability between these two sexes. So what we have here is actually one sex needs to gain access to the resources of the other sex. So what we have now is sexual selection. Okay. Now sexual selection can come in many different forms. All right. Uh, let's go through some of them. The more interesting ones, the very classical theory, which is female choice. Basically, you know, <laughs> females are 
are being very choosy, so the males have to court the male, the, the males have to court the females in order to gain access to sex. So you can do it by being, you know, physically attractive, or you can do it by, you know, having lots of resources. Like you know, there's there's this saying about how you know men, you know, bald men, no offense, always like to have big cars just to, you know, show that they have lots of uh, uh, resources in which to attract the females. Now, let's put this in the morphological sense. Uh, in a particular species of fly, um, they have actually developed very specific morphology just to impress the females. Let's look at this here. These, are, these flies are called Tamara superba, that's the species name. Okay? On, the, on this side, this is the female and this is the male trying to court the female. And this is a picture of them in copula. So this was actually taken by um, having them mating halfway, and then I just throw them into liquid nitrogen, which freezes them on the spot. <laughs> all for science, all for science. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'll draw your attention to the abdomen of the males. So this is where the action is all at, okay? This is the male abdomen. So insects come in three parts. There's the head, there's the what we call the thorax, and there's the abdomen. This is where we have the abdomen. This is where the genitalia are at. And if you look at this, okay, this is a whole tuft of brushes, okay? This is a ventral view, which means like the, the bottom view of the abdomen of the male fly. Now if you look at this, this very specialized structure here, this is actually what we call a sternite brush. Okay, on insects, usually on the abdomen, insect uh, abdomens are basically covered by hardened plates, these things here, sclerites. However, in this particular species of fly, uh, one of the plates has actually evolved into these huge appendage-like structures, which is basically not seen in any other kinds of insects. Basically, only in this kind of fly, we have the uh, complete new set of legs on the abdomen, all right? And what is it used for? These are what we call French ticklers. When he's mating with the female, as you can see here, he's using the brushes to tap her, to stimulate her. Sorry about the quality, but yeah, basically you can see here, he's like... So while well, as he's mating, he's like, hey, hey baby, hey. Now this is a really amazing uh, evolution of morphology here. Now in the ground state, when I say ground state, it means like you know the ancestral state. Basically, all insects have like these small plate-like structures. However, because of sexual selection, these plates have actually evolved in the male to become such amazing structures. All is not lovey dovey, of course. Uh, in the same species of fly. Next. Okay, now if we would try to focus on the forelegs now, this is how it looks like. As you can see, there are nasty looking spines and spikes and it's even shaped like a little sinoid shape. And this is what it's used for. It's used for clasping onto the female wing to prevent her from escaping. Alright? <laughs> so it's not just trying to impress her, he's, he's playing the um, passive-aggressive way, you know. he's. Grabbing onto her, her wings, once he manages to latch onto her wings, she basically tries not to struggle that much because if she does struggle, these nasty looking spines will actually pierce her wings and damage her. Alright, so this is really a, a nasty way of uh, saying, hey, you're not going to go anywhere, let's mate. <laughs> now, remember this? This is the pond skaters I showed you. Here's another case where basically these. These are the antennae of the insect. Most insect antennae are just basically very smooth, slender uh, appendages. However, in this particular species, we can see the nasty spikes and spines growing out again. And what it's used for to actually grab on to resistant females. So what he does is he'll look up, seek out a female, and then basically latch onto her, and she'll try to struggle until she ties up, and then she gives in, and then they mate. All right. What about hermaphrodites? Are they subject to sexual selection as well? All right. What is a hermaphrodite? Basically, it's any organism that has both male and female sex organs. All all snails, gastropods, basically, all snails are 
uh, uh, hermaphrodites. They have both male and female uh, organs. So in any case of mating, they will try to inseminate each other. However, they also have this specialized love dart, which you can see here. Okay, it has nothing to do with uh, a, you know mating. Basically, it's a dart when they when they start coming together and they 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 want to mate. One of the snails will actually try to fire this love dart into the other snail. When he does that, when it does that, basically it's, it, it will alter the physiology of the other snail, making it more receptive to the sperm that comes from this guy here. Okay? So if I fire my love dart at the other uh, snail, what happens is she will, she, he, it will become more receptive. <laughs> Sorry about that. It will become more receptive to my sperm. When I um, uh, when I actually shoot my sperm at it, <laughs> so these are the different kinds of love darts which you can see. Some of them are really quite nasty looking. Look at this, all right. And, and basically, uh, the you know Cupid. Cupid was actually a uh, uh, comes from the Greeks, right? So and the Greeks were well known to be naturalists. So people are actually thinking historians actually wonder if the love dart actually came from. The idea here, from snails. Alright, more about sexual conflict. Now this, has anyone been bitten by bed bugs before? Nobody? Oh yeah, he has. Okay, if you think that bed bugs are having nasty uh, feeding habits, well, their sex life is even worse. If you look here, okay, this is basically uh, two bed bugs mating. Here's the male and here's the female. Nice, you know, lusty tumble they have there. Okay, so... In all insects, the vagina is basically located here. However, he's, what is he doing here? The abdomen, okay? The penis is going through here. It's going right through the abdomen, all right? This is the penis of a bed bug, all right? So basically, these guys practice what we call traumatic insertions. This grabs a female and just, oh, whatever. <laughs> Stabs her, anywhere. The sperm will travel throughout the body of the female, seeks out the uh, ovaries, and then inseminate it. All right. Why? Why does the bed bug do that? All right. Many reasons. The female in the female vaginal tract. There are many ways of the female uh, for the female to actually manipulate the sperm, uh, and it has many defenses to stop the sperm from getting into uh, inseminating the particular uh, inseminating the eggs. So these bed bugs have actually overcome this 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 female resistance strategy by basically just going punching through her defenses. Oops. Oops. What do I do? Okay. Uh, okay, not everything is stylus shaped. This here is another penis. This time the bean weevil. If you can see these are actually spines. Alright? So what he does is actually damage her vaginal tract. This is actually an SEM picture, scanning electron microscope picture of uh, the vaginal tract. And these are basically the spines. And this is all the damage that's being done to her vaginal tract. Now, why does the bean weevil do this? If he dam damages her vaginal tract enough, she cannot mate with any other male. And this uh, ensures that, you know, she is only carrying his offspring. All right? It's nasty for the female, but works for the male. That's why it happens. So, while we're on the topic of penises, here is basically the uh, penis of an insect. Here, this is actually a local fly farm in Singapore. Just about two years ago, we had a large study um, uh, looking at the insects found in the mangrove of, uh, mangroves of Singapore. One, this, this is actually one of the species found here. And if you look here, the wang of the fly is actually just as large as the abdomen. If you're going to compare sizes in the human, basically it's like this big. <laughs> on me. All right? So these flies are actually quite amazing. They, so the fe these flies are basically uh, uh, on the mud, you know, looking for grubs. The female's like running around on the mud, looking for grubs to eat. And then suddenly this male fly comes down. Hey, that one looks sexy. He flies down, picks up with her penis and flies off. This is why it's so big. How many people can actually claim to do that? I don't think so. Alright, in most insect penises, uh, it actually is like one of the most complex uh, genital organs ever in, in throughout all of uh, 
uh, the animal world. So in an insect penis, usually there is an external part, which is what we call a clasper here, as you can see here. It's basically used to grab onto the female abdomen, either to stimulate her or to prevent her from pulling off. Okay? And the internal organ, which is somewhere situated in here, it looks something like this. All right? Okay, so you can see there are many different kinds of uh, structures on the penis itself, internal penis. There are the, oops, there's this little spikes and spines, which is used to uh, either stimulate the female or damage her. Same likewise here. And these little things here, okay? These things are used to uh, find their way through the vaginal duct of the female because female vaginas in, in insects are actually a lot more different. They have like many different dead ends. So if the male actually uh, deposits his sperm in like a dead end, I mean, basically it's, it's all gone. <laughs> so he has to be really discerning as to which uh, orifice he, internal orifice he actually deposits his sperm. And, and this is why the bed bug actually, you know, Shans goes through, you know, just, just ignores all this and just basically stabs her straight through. <laughs> now, what about, what about uh, animals with no penises? The spider. You all see spiders everywhere. Do you know that they have no penises? Alright? So, how does the spider have sex then? Alright? It has these specialized sex arms. Circled here. <laughs> Don't laugh. This, it is true. Penny pulps. Alright? So, how does the spider have sex? When it's sexually mature and it wants to mate, what it does is it weaves a little specialized... Uh, a silken bowl and it masturbates into the bowl. <laughs> right? Then it uses these arms to suck up the sperm. And when it comes to the deed itself, it uses the arm to... <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> so this, here is an example. This is Cytodis pallida, uh, again local species, and called spitting spiders. And basically, all this white stuff is a uh, sperm. So I, I kind of killed the animal right after it, you know, it was getting ready. And uh, so all this white stuff is, is, is stuff getting ready to go to the female. Too bad for you. <laughs> all right, what about this? This guy, it's called the agronaut. All right, paper nautilus. All right, it has what I call it, I like to call it missile penis. <laughs> So basically, it doesn't even bother to have sex with a female. What it does, it, it sights the female over there. Boom! It fires this <laughs> missile laden with sperm, and it shoots it right into the female. <laughs> right, not all sexual dimorphism is actually because of sexual selection. Now, remember the log-like creature we saw here? Okay. Basically, this is because the males need to find the females, and the females are basically lady, lazy bums who just, they're parasites actually, they just reside in the abdomens of uh, other insects, as we can see here, and basically pop up pheromones to tell other males like, hey, I'm here, and then the males will actually fly over and mate with them. Yeah, almost done. Okay, now, last one, best for the last, sex bombs. Basically, these are marine worms, so uh, when they're ready to mate, what they do is actually grow out stolons. They build out little mini knees, which are filled with sperm and eggs, and then basically they just send all these mini knees, they just break off and then fly up, uh, um, swim up to the surface of the sea, and they explode. They explode in, in, in a huge orgy of sperm and eggs, and they make just like that. All right, so, uh, so what I can say is sexual selection, it is a very, very powerful force of creation, all right? And uh, people have suggest suggested that this is actually a main force of speciation, main force for, for, uh, uh, as, as a part of natural selection, all right? Because what, what studies have actually observed is like very closely related species only deviate by sexual characters most of the time. So this, I mean, there are many ongoing studies to actually uh, uh, um, see whether sexual selection is a, uh, the actual role for speciation in the diversity of animals we see today. Thank you.